How's everybody doing? All right. Well, welcome, welcome back, whichever that applies to you. Um, today we are uh, going to finish this two-part little short two-part series that we call Cultural Moment. Uh, if you weren't here last week, let me give you just kind of a quick kind of catch up to what we talked about so that you uh, get caught up. We started uh, last week to try and define the culture that we live in, and we defined it as post-Christian. Uh, and the post-Christian promise is really that uh, there is this, there is this, uh, this sense that we want to try and allow everyone to live their lives um, as free as possible to live in their own free will and desires. And it's bent on this idea of deconstruction and deregulation of authority and uh, this freedom from authority um, and, and autonomy can be attained uh, unfortunately, uh, what, what it has led to is this idea that as people have believed that this freedom has been taken, as people have believed that this authority um, or this autonomy has been uh, gained, uh, and we, they, our culture has seen that as progress, and, um, and that it's this, this space uh, of forward momentum for our world, uh, the only bad and sad thing about that is that every statistical study would say that's not true uh, because what has happened is as we have bent into this post-Christian mindset of gaining deconstruction and, and deregulating authority and, and striving for autonomy and freedom of ourselves, uh, it has led to, especially in the world of mental health, a, a, a huge, huge crisis. Larger than ever before in our world, mental health is a huge issue, specifically around depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. And so the culture that is striving for freedom is actually enslaving itself. And much of this has to do with this massive shift uh, in conventional thinking that started to take place in the 1970s. You know, I told you last week, think, you know, 1970s rock and roll. Think, you know, think uh, just about the, the sexual revolution and all the things that were uh, about that. Then you add on to uh, more modern movements of culture like uh, globalization and digital capitalization and the digital age in general, uh, massive divide in the governing bodies and structures of our democratic societies in the Western world um, where they're just at each other's throats and a church that's ill-equipped to deal with all of these changes. And that's where we are right now. And uh, the thrust of last week was really to help us understand that the culture that we live in um, is, is um, in this place of what we would consider um, crisis, um, and yet also the church for about the last 20, 25 years is in a bit of a crisis. And that many Christians... Um, past and present um, have experienced a, a culture um, that, that uh, in a Christian culture, in a church culture that is ill-equipped to deal with the issues that are at play. But the good news about all of this is that we're not alone, that there are plenty of, uh, there's plenty of history on our side of Christians uh, being the minority, and, um, and there's a lot of things within our culture that as we're the, we're the creative minority in our world, um, a place for us to see God move. The Bible gives us an answer as we maybe feel a little bit of angst and a little bit of anxiety around being in a culture like this. And, uh, and what it is, is Jesus' words to take heart. It's actually our memory verse for today. It's uh, John 16, 33. It says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. I've told you these things so that you will have peace. Right? There was going to be trouble in this world. You're going to have trouble, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. It's Matthew 16, or, or not Matthew, John 16, 33. And that's our verse for today in our memory verse challenge that we gave you guys last week. Um, but we, we said, man, like, well, the, the, the position that we have to hold is this position where we're not anxious about the future, but we take heart and remember the hope that we have. We live a life worthy of the gospel, not afraid, but we trust that God's got this, that there may be trouble on the horizon, but he's overcome the world. And this might very well be the conditions in which God sparks revival in his people. 
Because when the world is in crisis and the church is in crisis, that is uh, what Mark Sayers has said or deemed as the time when most great awakenings happen. Uh, and, but that's a big if, right? It's a big if. And if that's going to happen, we must come to a place of where we operate not from strength, but operate from a place of weakness and desperation. So today, that's what we're unpacking. We're going to try and answer this question of what does it look like for the church to operate from a place of weakness and desperation? What does it look like? Well, let me, let me start to unpack this in um, a couple different ways. In order for us in the church to, um, to actually cry out and turn to God in a situation like that, we must be resilient disciples, okay? This is, a, this is a really, really important aspect of being able to even spark something or, or see God move in our midst, is that we must be resilient followers of Jesus. And the recent studies that I've looked at, um, it, it says probably things that many of you know and probably even experience. What it says is that church attendance alone will not bring about an intimate relationship with Jesus. And an intimate relationship with Jesus is the flagship, like, marker of a resilient disciple. In the the generation, uh, my generation, the millennial generation, and then in Gen Z's, the generation right after me, uh, they they did a statistical study of, of people from 18 to 29 years old. And out of those 18 to 29 year olds, um, 90% of them who grew up going to church no longer are engaged in their faith. 52% don't go to church at all or only show up on holidays or just to make mom happy. Um, Another 38% go habitually, uh, meaning that they show up about once a month on average. And then 10%, 10% are resilient disciples. And it isn't because they go to church, it's because they have an intimate relationship with Jesus. See, the reason that these 10% are able to stay resilient is because they're committed to being with Jesus. It becomes the greatest source of their identity. It becomes the flagship mark of their life. It becomes their true north in every situation, every circumstance as they kind of move throughout. And as they spend time with Christ, they remember that they're saved, that they're rescued, they're redeemed, they're chosen, and they become more and more confident in the hope that they have in Christ. And as culture becomes more scary and unpredictable and question is, are we able to hold on to that hope? Do we have a deep, rich, intimate relationship with Jesus? Because that is the flagship mark of a resilient disciple. And I don't just say being with Jesus is important because it's the first part of our catchy mission statement. <laughs> I don't. I, I, say it, I say it because it truly has been proven by surveys and statistical analysis that the confident hope that resilient disciples, especially young resilient disciples between 18 and 29, have in our world, and they're a vast majority of their culture, 10%. They are a remnant. They, they say that they are rooted and grounded in their Christian faith, and they don't just go to church, but they find joy in their relationship with God. That their relationship with Christ gives them a hope to navigate the difficult waters of this cultural moment. And I don't know if all of us are there. I don't know if all of us have this resilient faith that as this cultural moment arises, do we have a true relationship with Jesus that gives us a confident hope through the difficult things that are ahead. See, the thing, um, the thing that uh, marks this intimate relationship with Jesus, there are four things, four things that mark this intimate relationship with Jesus. All right, so I'm going to go through these four things, and then we'll kind of talk about them as we go. All right, first one is a faith rooted in community. So they say it's not just about going to church. 
Um, that's not what all of this is about for them, but it's actually a faith that's rooted in community. They are in relationship with other believers. They have, they have this commitment and this connection with, with other believers that they want to be around and that they want to become like. So that's huge in their faith. The Bible is also a consistent place where they find the truth of Scripture. Like they build their life on the truth of God's Word. They draw inspiration from it for every area of their life and believe that it is true and it applies to every area of their life. The third thing is, is they consistently um, are talking and listening to Jesus. They have a, a, a faith that is built on this consistent prayer life Um, day in and day out, and then they also are engaged in the mission of God. Their faith is being expressed and making an impact in the world. This This is what defines resilient disciples. And as I read these studies, right, uh, because I I hear a lot of things as a millennial, I hear a lot of things from especially older generations about how awful my generation is. And, um, and, and, (laughs) I got to tell you, but this really gave me hope for my generation. It gave me hope for the next generation. It gave me a lot of energy and a lot of excitement to look forward. As I looked at this data and I unpacked the numbers and I saw what was taking place and the trends uh, of discipleship in this generation um, and the next generation, it is just such a beautiful thing because the age-old tactics of Acts chapter 2, they still work. (laughs) Better than anything else to produce disciples. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says this, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Okay? You guys see all that? It's all the same stuff, right? It's all the same stuff. It might look different. It might feel a little different, but it's all the same things. It's a life centered around the Bible. New Testament is written primarily by these apostles, and it's full of their teachings, Okay, it's a it's a life centered around the fellowship and the community of people, a commitment to that community that they are committed to serving one another in love, that they are committed to bearing one another's burdens, that they're committed to to remembering what unites them instead of talking about all the things that divide them. What unites them? The body and blood of Christ. And these are diverse people. These are people from different languages and backgrounds. On the first day, like the, the Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, everybody hears the word in their own language. You know what that means? Many of them didn't speak the same language. Meaning that this church that's being formed is very diverse, very beautiful, very multi-ethnic. And yet they don't talk about all the differences. What they, what they remember is they remember what unites them by breaking bread and taking communion together, finding a rootedness and a connectedness through the body and blood of Christ. This is so important. And then it says they devoted themselves to prayer. They get on their knees together day in and day out in desperation, crying out for God to show them how they can discern and do his will in the world. And the coolest thing is that this language that Luke is writing here in Acts is very deliberate. It's very, very deliberate. Um, And I'm going to explain why in just a minute. But look at verse 43 before we go any further. Verse 43 says, And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Have you guys heard anything like this before? Have you heard people talking about awe and wonder and amazement at amazing things that are being done? I hope you have. If you've read the Gospels, you have. <laughs> if you've read the, the, the four books before the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll hear this all the time, 33 times. 33 times in the Gospels, you will hear that either the disciples or people that were around Jesus They saw him do something amazing or heard him say something that was amazing, and it left them in awe. It left them amazed. Luke says it 10 times. Luke says it 10 times in his gospel. It's only second to Mark, who says it 12 times, and Mark is chock full of 
way more like miracles and stuff. So that's probably why. But Luke is, is really intent here in his language. And what Luke is doing, if you don't know, Luke uh, writes his gospel and then immediately writes the book of Acts uh, right after that. And so he, uh, he, he writes Luke, and then the sequel to Luke is actually the book of Acts. And what the book of Luke is about, it's about the life and the teaching of Jesus, and it's about him bringing forth the kingdom and dying on the cross to save us from our sins. And the book of Acts is the continuation of that story that now focuses on the life and the teaching and the formation of the kingdom under the apprenticeship of the disciples. And so they go in correlation. And so what Luke is trying to point out here is that what's happening in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 43, is that the disciples are living the life that Jesus showed them to live. And this is really important. I say that they're living the life because I myself and churches all over have used Acts chapter 2, verse 42 as a systematic way to form church. They said like, oh, well, you know, let's, let's do these things and let's, you know, do these things and we need to have sermons because they teach and all of that, right? And so it's like a, a systematic way of making church work and making church happen. The problem is, is that for Jesus, it's not a system, it's a lifestyle. And, and so that's what happens with the disciples. They begin to live out this lifestyle. It's what they've always done with Jesus. That's what they did. Jesus called them together in community. Very diverse people. And he started working with them. He started teaching them. He started loving on them. They started sharing everything together. They're doing what Jesus showed them to do. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. What do they do? They take the Lord's Supper together. This is, this is huge. This is huge. Jesus was a person of prayer. They're praying together. It's a lifestyle. If you want the life that Jesus has, which he actually offers to you, he says, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. That's his life. If you want the life that he has, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And that's what happens with these early disciples. They adopt the lifestyle of Jesus, and then not only that, but they're doing the things Jesus does. So they start doing the stuff that Jesus was doing. They start healing people. They start, they start uh, helping the poor. They start lifting up those who are lowly in society and elevating them to a place of honor and dignity. They are doing what Jesus does. It's a really, really powerful thing that Luke is doing here. And many of us, we have to stop thinking of these things as systematic, and we have to think of them as a lifestyle. We have to live this way. And so let me get back to our question. What does it look like for the church to operate from a place of weakness and desperation? Here's what I think. We have, we have in all of our good intention as the church... And all of our good intention as the people of God, we have taken things that are supposed to be our lifestyle and turned them into a system. And we have to now figure out a way to repent and then start pursuing a different way. And here's what I mean by that. When we talk about repent, that word means to turn. It just means to turn. So think about a U-turn, right? You're going one direction. You turn and go the other direction. Holly Springs loves to repent. That's the way I think about it, right? <laughs> We have U-turns every 14 feet. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the thing is, is that like I, I just, I know that like that's, that's really what God's calling us to, I think, as a people to in desperation, in our weakness, not our strength, because our systems and processes are not doing what this did. Our systems and processes are not bringing more and more believers to the fold. But our lifestyle can but we have to repent, we have to turn. We have to get to a place where we stop, we stop living life the way our culture lives life and adopting cultural lifestyles and adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. We have to stop doing things the way our culture does things and start doing things the way Jesus did things. Primarily, we need to be about community and scripture 
in prayer, in mission. We need to be moving in this direction. Let me, let me give you examples of how we need to repent. Right? We're talking about community. What do we need to repent of? What do we need to turn away from? Well, our culture is bent on this idea of individualism. Did you know that? Our culture is all about individualism. It's all about like, you know what? You can do what you want. You can be what you want. And it doesn't matter if anyone agrees with you. And you don't need anybody's help to do it either. Right? You can be whoever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. And you don't need anyone else. People have even started to think that like they can be a disciple of Jesus by themselves. Like that they can just sit at home and watch sermons and like not be connected to a community. It's not going to work. It will not work. This individualism is, is demonic. And I'm all for like going out there to try and be the person that God's called you to be. So that you can do his will and live in his desire for you. But what our culture says is go be whatever you want to be for yourself. Because if you're who you want to be, our world will be a better place. No, our world will be a better place when you are the person that God has created you to be. And you cannot be that person outside of community. We have to repent from this thought process and this ideology. We have to move to to think more about the life of Jesus. This was not a part of the life and ministry of Jesus. We have to pursue community with other disciples, people that we really admire, that we enjoy being around, who are following Jesus and who we want to be like. That's really, we have to do this, right? And you also have to understand that being a part of a community isn't just for your benefit. It's not about you, right? Like when you're not at life group, when you're not at core group, when you're not at church, when you don't show up for the dinner, when, you don't, when you're not engaged with other believers, it's not you that loses. It's everybody. It's the body of Christ that loses. But it's hard because we have this ideal vision of community and what community will look like. But I love what Gene Vare says about community. I want to I share this quote with you. Um, he says this, he says, all, all, almost everyone finds their early days in a community ideal. It all seems perfect. They feel like they are surrounded by saints and heroes or at least the most exceptional people who are everything that they want to be themselves. And then comes the letdown. The greater the idealization of the community at the start, the greater the disenchantment. If people manage to get through this second period, they come to a third phase, that of realization and of true commitment. They no longer see other members of the community as saints or devils, but as people, each with a mixture of good and bad, darkness and light, each growing and each with their own hope. The community is neither heaven nor hell, but planted firmly on earth, and they are ready to walk in it. And with it, they accept the community and the other members as they are. They are confident that together they can grow towards something more beautiful. This is one of my favorite quotes about community. Uh, and every time I read it, 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 like, it makes me want to just like get a huge poster and put it on a wall somewhere. Um, but here's the reality. We have, to, we have to repent of our cultural individualism and pursue with confidence that we can together move towards something more beautiful. But we also, the second thing we have to repent of is we have to repent of our cultural addiction to digital media and our idols and ideologies of our culture uh, and our cultural moment. And we have to consistently engage in the word of God to provide us with truth. We need to pursue strong biblical literacy. Charles Chu built out a study about the reading capacity of the average American 
Uh, and what he found was that the average American can read between 200 and 400 words per minute. Uh, this means that in a fraction of the time that most of our world spends on digital media, we could actually all be avid readers. And at that speed, we could all read about four books a week in just about 417 hours a year. Now, that probably sounds like a lot because you're probably thinking that's more than an hour of reading every single day. But how many hours a day does the average American spend on um, on social media in a year? You want to guess? 700. Almost double. Almost double. You want to know how much time the average American spends watching television each year? 2,737 hours a year. That's seven hours a day. The average American spends watching television. Now, apply this logic to the Bible, all right? And in one hour a day before bed, we could all, at that speed of 200 to 400 words per minute, we could all read the Bible in six months. The whole thing, cover to cover. Now, I would never encourage you to do that, just so you know. <laughs> Like, I would not encourage you to do that because, one, I, I, I think that, like, that fast pace going through the Bible, you're just going to you're just gonna probably race through it. You're not going to retain much of it. And although it will be good for filling your mind with God's Word and Scripture and stuff like that, and that is valuable, um, there is something to be said about understanding it and taking it in so it actually can make impact in our life. So it can actually change us. So it can actually move us. And as resilient disciples, one of the things that they identify is that they stay consistently connected in God's word, and they spend a lot less time on screens. They spend a lot less time on screens. Now, some of you in the room, that might be you. That might be who you are. You might be the people who are like, no screens here, right? My screen time, you can look at it. It's like 15 minutes a day, you know? Uh, but that's not most people in the, our world and in our culture, and I would guess probably not most people in our church. And, uh, and I want to just remind you of what we talked about last week and the, the verse that we kicked off our scripture memorization with, which is Psalm 1, 1 and 2, where it says, Bless the one who does not walk in the way of the wicked or stand in the place that sinners take or sit in the seat of mockers, but who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on that law day and night. Now, there's a key word in this psalm, and it's the word meditates. And this word in Hebrew means to chew on. It means actually, it's like it's the word used when talking or describing uh, a cow chewing the cud or a dog with a bone. They're just gnawing on it and gnawing on it and gnawing on it until there's nothing left. They're just constantly in pursuit. That's what meditating on God's word day and night is about. It's about really getting in there and really diving in and, and just, just like gnawing on God's word. So that he can move in your life. You know, Jesus, he says, um, he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, he says, blessed, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I think, and this is Derek thinks, okay, so let me move over here because the Bible's over here and Derek's here. All right? So I think what Jesus is talking about in that is Psalm 1. When he's talking about a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, I think he's talking about a hunger and thirst for the law and the word of God. Blessed is one who hungers and thirsts, who chews after it and goes after it and gnaws on it and just can't get enough. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, as we land the plane today, I want to I wanna talk about this last thing. <laughs> that I think is really important, which is prayer. And in order to really carve out space to pray and be intentional in our prayer, we have to repent of the rapid, frantic pace that we've adopted from our culture in order that we can slow down and seek God in prayer. Many of us are trying to we're trying to manage our relationship with Jesus while multitasking other things. We listen to the Bible when we drive. We pray while we take a shower. 
There's something to be said about just, just letting Jesus have your full and undivided attention. And just moving away from the frantic pace to a slower way of living. And a slower way of walking through our days in order to focus on God. In the quiet places of our own personal lives, but also together as a church. There's no secret that whenever we call a prayer gathering, it's the lowest attended thing we do. Why is that? I'll give you two reasons. Because we already have other commitments. We're very busy. And two, we don't really want to. People do what they want to do. And people don't really want to sit in the quiet and talk to God and let him talk to them. One of the things about resilient disciples in these studies that I saw is that they consistently, they consistently say that they feel like God speaks to them. That God speaks to them. That only happens whenever you're quiet and still enough to listen. And so we have to repent of that frantic pace and we have to pursue God in prayer. And as we kind of leave here, I want to I leave here because I think prayer is actually the bridge between the lifestyle of Jesus and the mission of Jesus. Like I think like we won't be very good missionaries in our culture if we haven't been like completely full of the Spirit by, by spending intent time in prayer. And I, and I honestly, I don't know that we'll be able to repent of the things that we need to repent of without praying that God change us and, and move us to hunger for these things. Like we need his spirit to move in us because we probably aren't just going to just like rapidly disconnect from our digital world, right? And I don't, I'm not saying that you absolutely have to or should in order to be with Jesus. I'm just saying that like we're going to have to let him convict our hearts and move us in this direction by his spirit. And that's prayer. The only way we can do that is to ask God to do that and see what he does. But I want to I want to finish with this passage, this prayer that actually Jesus himself prays. And he prays it for you and he prays it for me. And so I want to go to John chapter 17 where Jesus prays this. He says, "My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one." They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I, or you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, in, and I in them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me. And have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus' life is rooted in prayer. And um, as he's getting ready to head into the dark night of the soul, he's getting ready to head to the cross. And he's getting ready to die for you and me, for our sins, so that we can be with him. <laughs> like, so we can actually have a relationship with him. All that we're talking about today. And he as he's getting ready to head there to die for you and me he prays for you and me and you know what his prayer is about his prayer is about that you will not take them out of the world because they they have a mission they have a mission that you would sanctify them by the word of truth that his word is truth and that he would use that word to change us and transform us. 
And then he prays that we would have unity, community, fellowship with one another. Isn't that fascinating? So Jesus gets ready to head to the cross. These are the things he prays for. Jesus raises from the dead. And then in Acts chapter 1, he empowers his disciples to go and be on mission and live in the lifestyle that he has given them. And what is it all about? It's all about, it's all about prayer and community and the word. And, and it's all about doing what he has done. And because of their presence in the culture, because of the sanctifying work of the word, because of the unity they share in Christ, they become witnesses. They become witnesses, salt and light, revealing the love of Jesus to the world. It's incredible. It's almost like Jesus had something to do with all this. You know? And so here, here's, I'm going to answer the question with a prayer of my own. What does it look like for us to be desperate, operating from a place of weakness? Well, it's that we would begin to get on our knees and join in the prayer of Jesus. That we would lower ourselves and begin to pray until we can't pray anymore. That God will change us by his word that he will unite us as the church, that we might be resilient disciples who can do the things that he does. But we need him for it all. So may we get on our knees and join with him in this prayer. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for your love and your grace. And uh, Jesus, thank you for meeting us here in this place, in our culture, and in this cultural moment. And God, I believe that you can, you can spark something special and revival to take place in us and through us if, God, we will just get down, get down on our knees and begin to cry out, desperately crying out to you that you would change us, that you would unite us, that you would keep us coming back to you over and over again in prayer, that you would, would empower us for mission, to share your love with the world. And so God, please, God, please move in our hearts. Move in our hearts to bring us to our knees, to cry out to you, because we need you. We need you right now in this place and in this cultural moment. We need you. May we just cry out how much we need you. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to uh, stand in just a moment and move to grab communion. Uh, there's two tables in the back and two tables up front um, already prepared. And, and so in just a moment, uh, just stand and, and move to those places and we'll respond. But I just, you know, I just think this is a moment for us where we can just begin to cry out, where we can begin to just speak of the need that we have for His Spirit to come and do these things. And it's, the, 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 it's a moment for us to just cry out and ask Him to, to move and power through His Word and change us and transform us. This is a moment where we can just turn our attention in his direction and let it be um, kind of a cornerstone and foundation for us as we continue forward. All right, so uh, you guys can stand, move, and take communion whenever you feel that.